so happy we alive. Patrick Moore, and welcome again to www.moresongs.com. We're here in Washington, D.C., and I'm delighted to have a uh, tremendous author to speak very briefly, at least with us. Uh, let me say this by way of introduction. A, uh, oh, a year or so ago, I was talking with a associate, a cardi cardiovascular surgeon from California named uh, Tom O'Connell, and uh, I asked Tom what some of his personal uh, interests were, and one of them was uh, doing some writing in the area of the drug reform movement. And uh, I talked with Tom a few months later, and I asked him how his how he progressed on his goal, and he told me that he had moved on to other aspects of activism within the movement, but that uh, he'd, he'd uh, temporarily ceased writing because he had discovered a book that was written so well, was so much to the point, and expressed the beliefs and concepts that he wanted to get across so well that he had simply put down the pen and uh, he told me the name of this book was Drug Crazy by Mike Gray. And uh, just by coincidence, uh, a while later I saw Mr. Gray's book and uh, got a copy and uh, I read it and uh, I've shared it with uh, any number of friends, uh, all of whom have told me that uh, in reading this book, they discovered aspects of the war on drug and the drug reform movement that uh, they had never had, had never uh, compelled them in such a way, and and uh, so that is the what's coming from the past. What I see in the future is uh, if if these things have not already occurred my astrological self predicts that, that this book, Mike Gray's uh, Drug Crazy, will be turned into some kind of a screenplay and in turn turned into some kind of a, a movie format and that it will come forth uh, into the uh, televisions and theaters of the world and uh, will be a happy little piece of fireworks in what's coming ahead for a happier world. Now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for those kind thoughts, Patrick. It's very nice of you. Uh, I put uh, six years of uh, uh, research into the book, research and writing, and uh, basically, uh, I, it, I, I must say, it was one of the most shocking experiences I've ever had, and, uh, and I've had some shocking experiences. But uh, uh, writing and researching drug crazy uh, profoundly changed my thinking about the whole uh, drug problem and how we got into this mess and how we can get out. Uh, it's, uh, it, it was amazing to me to discover that 100% of the scientific evidence, uh, the uh, uh, logic, is all on one side of the argument. That there is absolutely no scientific, political, or moral uh, evidence that weighs in on behalf of drug prohibition. Interestingly, one of the most amazing things that I discovered when I was digging into this problem was we did not have a drug problem in the United States until we created this ourselves. Uh, in, uh, when the drug war began in this country, it was in 1914, the first uh, drug laws were passed against uh, uh, public uh, possession and consumption of narcotics. Prior to that time, if you wanted drugs, you uh, or needed drugs because you were addicted to morphine or whatever, uh, you simply went to your doctor and uh, he wrote you a prescription for whatever you were addicted to, and uh, you took that to the drugstore, which is where you used to get drugs, and uh, and the pharmacist gave you whatever it was that you needed, and you then shot it or drank it or swallowed it or whatever. And then you went off to work 
today because all of the, uh, the, the at least 80% of the addicts in the United States that we were able to uh, uh, keep records on had jobs and homes and families and were taxpaying productive citizens with a medical problem that was handled by their doctor. And interestingly, there weren't that many of them. You know, when this began in 1914, there were only two or three hundred thousand addicts in the entire United States. The best estimates that Harvard historian uh, David Musto has come up with compiling all the various results points to somewhere around 250,000 addicts in the entire United States. Now, at that time, that would represent three people in a thousand, okay? Eighty years later, after the expenditure of a trillion dollars at the cost of tens of thousands of lives and filling the prisons to the rafters, we've managed to increase that figure of addiction by a factor of five. We now have 15 people per thousand addicted to morphine and so forth. So, uh, you would have to say by any measure, the war on drugs has been an absolutely colossal disaster. And uh, we're now spending $17 billion a year in federal money, a matching amount in the states, for a total of $30 billion uh, annually on the war on drugs just here in the United States. We've uh, arrested a million people uh, every year for uh, marijuana offenses. And all of the scientific evidence, I must say, I've read the vast majority of this stuff. I was trained as an engineer. so. Engineers are interested in facts. We're not, uh, I mean, the reason we were able to go to the moon is because there is no religious orthodoxy about gravity, right? You, uh, uh, you, you just simply have to go by the rules and design it according to reality. You can't just create your own reality. In this arena, in the, in the, in, uh, uh, the area of drug use and abuse, we are living in a fantasy world. And yet, rather than keeping drugs out of the hands of children, which was certainly our intention when we got involved in this, I mean, I would say, wouldn't you, that that's, that's uh, the number one goal Concern. that everybody can agree on is how do we keep these drugs out of the hands of our kids? Exactly, that's a big selling point. Right, and in, that, in the drugs we include, of course, alcohol and tobacco and marijuana and morphine and everything else. Um, a worthwhile goal. What have we done instead? We've created a situation where uh, it's easier for them to get heroin and marijuana than it is to get beer, which is insane. And, and we've created a situation where kids have to be on the front line in the marketplace, in a marketplace that's so dangerous they have to be armed. Um, they passed a law in Illinois trying to uh, get at the root of uh, these, and they, the law was uh, um, <laughs> if you were caught dealing anything within uh, a thousand yards of a school, a church, or a public park, uh, you get a mandatory 10, it was a class X felony, and you get a mandatory 10 years. Uh, well, that covers all of the city of Chicago, because uh, almost every place in the city is within a thousand yards of a park, a playground, or a school. So. Um, what happened? I mean, did that eliminate drug dealing around schools? No, it didn't even touch the problem. What it did was, the, the next morning, all the dealers on the street were under 15. Because if you're under 15, you're ineligible for a mandatory sentence uh, under this law. Uh, you get 30 days in the Audi home. So what happened was, all the uh, dealers just simply sent their little brothers out into the street. And they had one dealer, when I was riding with the, the cops in Chicago, the undercover cops doing research for drug crazy, um, they had one kid there who was 11. You know, this is what we've accomplished with a regimen of prohibition, which was insane. I mean, this is a replay of alcohol prohibition, it's, uh, you know, just with different shading. Far more dangerous, a lot more money involved. And the people that, uh, that are operating in this arena right now would make Al Capone look like a Sunday school teacher. So anyhow, that's... Well, let me, let me, let me just interject, interject, interject and say this. is uh, One thing that I was going to ask you, which is... Uh, asking the ultimate extreme is, is simply